Welcome to Medical Matters Weekly with Dr. Trey Dobson, presented by Southwestern Vermont Healthcare and Catamount Access Television. Welcome, everyone. Today is June 29th, 2022. This is a live broadcast and, of course, will be recorded and uh, put forth later as a podcast and other different ways to participate. I'm Trey Dobson, Chief Medical Officer at Southwestern Vermont Healthcare and an emergency medicine physician with Dartmouth Health. And this is Medical Matters Weekly, a show about the aspects of medicine that matter to you most. My guest today is Dr. Michael Roizen. He's the Chief Wellness Officer Emeritus at Cleveland Clinic. Uh, Michael, welcome. Privileged to be here, Trey. Thank you for inviting me. Do you like to be called Mike or Michael? Anything you want. <laughs> Great. And where are you right now? I can see the light shining through your window in the background. Um, I'm at the uh, Cleveland Clinic at our Wellness uh, Institute uh, site, or main site. We actually serve, um, have about eight different locations in, in and around Cleveland for a Wellness Institute. But this is in Lyndhurst, Ohio, which is about seven miles from our main downtown campus of the Cleveland Clinic. Oh, it's great. So I'm going to give a little bit on uh, Dr. Roizen's background. And of course, in the audience, uh, you can always log on to the website and see the full bio. Uh, he has served several graduate uh, academic appointments at the University of California, San Francisco, University of Chicago, worked as the CEO of the Biotechnology Research Corporation of Central New York, which I'm going to ask you about because I'm interested in that. Uh, over 190 peer-reviewed publications. That's quite a lot of writing. Um, if you're, uh, if that's a question, uh, correct. Um, and uh, I was lucky enough to be at uh, NIH um, as a uh, what is in that era called the Green Beret or the Yellow Beret was actually what we were called. Um, we were an elite group of medical people who were recruited uh, and we applied and went through a winnowing process. And I got a really wonderful background in research there. It was uh, um, during the Vietnam era and the closest we would get to Vietnam was Bethesda, Maryland, they told us. Um, and so that was the, the reason they request, they had 30 of us a year. Uh, Dr. Fauci was one of those in a prior year as well, but I got to work with uh, Nobel Prize winner Julie Axelrod and Irv Kopin in their lab, and that uh, started the, I, I learned how to both do research and write about it in that period. Well, that's great. And yes, that was a question. Actually, I was kind of just throwing out the statement that was remarkable. And I, I was hoping you would explain how you uh, got through that. Also has served on uh, advisory committees to the Food and Drug Administration um, and, and chaired one of those FDA committees, uh, has authored uh, several books for number one New York Times bestsellers. And then maybe most importantly for those around this area is a graduate of Williams College. And, and that so shout out to those. That actually started me on my writing career because we were forced to take a English uh, 101 too, even though I was a pre-med and science major. And uh, my, and this actually was what motivated me. My uh, um, professor in the first course took me in after about three weeks to, to uh, if you will, submissions he graded and said, Mike, what do you want to be in life? And I said, I pre-med, I'm going to, hopefully be a physician, sir. And he said, uh, it's a good thing because if you had anything to do with writing, you'd never make it. Um, and so part of my uh, getting good at writing, or at least writing a number one New York Times bestseller, that first one was I wanted, he, his goal in life was to write a New York Times bestseller and I wanted to beat him at it. So that was part of my, <laughs> part of my motivation. Maybe he even knew that when he called you in. I'm going to motivate this kid. Uh, that's fantastic. I actually have a very similar story. Basically, the, the professor just put the big F on, on the first page and said, there you go. And so that helped motivate me as well, although uh, not to your level. So tell us just a little bit about, uh, about your background and where you're from uh, and how you got into medicine in the first place. Well, I grew up in uh, Buffalo, New York, and when I was nine years old, a physician came to me, our house, a pediatrician. I was sicker than heck, 
Um, I still remember his name, Richard Fisher. And uh, I probably had a strep um, or a strep infection at that time. He gave me a shot. I was vomiting and throwing up and feeling absolutely horrible. And within six hours, I felt great. And I said, isn't that incredible? He really helped. Uh, you can go into a profession that helps people and uh, do it that fast. And so that motivated me to say, I want to be a physician. And uh, from, from nine years on, uh, that's what I focused on. And that's great. And then you ended up at Williams College and you knew the whole time, I guess, there that you might be a physician. Tell us a little bit about your time there, though. Just again, so, a shout out to those folks. Uh, oh, it's, it, it is a tremendous place. The camaraderie among the students, the interactions. In other words, I was, I, I was a chemistry major and uh, double majored in uh, chemistry and economics or minored in economics. I ended up not doing that um, full time. But anyway, and they, it, by the time you're a junior in both economics and in chemistry, you're working with maybe 12 people in a class. Um, so there's a lot of intense uh, effort. In addition, almost everyone plays or it, it plays a sport there. And so I uh, was lucky enough to uh, play squash. Um, full, and, uh, it was, it's a, it's, it's just a wonderful environment to, um, I really was lucky enough to be able to develop. Um, and then, uh, I should tell you that my, uh, children, our children, my wife and my children, uh, both went to Williams, uh, Jeffrey, um, captain, the squash team. And the incredible thing is I got to tell you this story cause it's so funny. Um, yeah. when, uh, he was a senior in playing Amherst, which is our uh, major rival. Um, I looked on the court and the guy he was playing looked awful similar. And then up in the gallery, I noticed um, his father, who was the same guy I played um, <laughs> against like 26 years ago in uh, the oh Williams Amherst God. match. So uh, that was, I mean, how, how what, what? coincidence that was but anyway and and our daughter and he's now jeffrey our son is a uh um phd md at uh children's hospital philadelphia pediatric endocrinologist our daughter went there also uh she um was the la i was one of the early students j hodge margraf had as a uh understudy if you will and uh jennifer was our daughter was one of the last um and she went on to caltech got a phd in organic chemistry and now uh works uh to help alternative energy programs at the department of energy well in california is that where she's based uh she's actually based in uh raleigh durham but also in washington dc okay well, that's, that's uh, and, fantastic and uh my wife the the one of the uh, the best things I did was uh, met my wife in an emergency room in Cambridge City. Um, uh, she was an intern at Mass General when I was a resident at Beth Israel in Boston. And uh, she asked to borrow my ophthalmoscope and otoscope. Uh, and so uh, that we got married and that was the best thing I've done in life. Oh, what a what a great corny doctor pickup line! Then may I borrow your otoscope? I love it. <laughs> oh, tell us a little bit about the pu public health service. And, and one reason I also bring this up uh, is we've actually had several guests, uh, and I've noticed that folks that went into public health um, or did did a time with public health service really have some insight in, into medicine. And unfortunately, I did not do that myself, and and I missed that. And I love learning from those who have. And so the, the lab was a um, intense lab. You have a Nobel Prize winner running the lab. Um, you, <laughs> you have a, a lot of, so, um, a, a lot of uh, push. Um, so at, at NIH in that era, there was a, in one room, there was a Metier scale, how you measured out the compounds there was clearly a push to develop science to invent. But when you went to that Metier scale, at, I would go there at seven in the morning, uh, Julie Axelrod was in the room. 
he his desk was there there was one scale in the lab and he was he was he had his office in that where the scale was and so you knew when you went in that room he was going to quiz you no matter what time you did it um because he was there from 7 a.m to at least 6 p.m every day and he was going to quiz you on what the heck you were doing and why you were doing it that day and so it was a wonderful experience of of uh, both being forced to, to express yourself, to um, understand what you were doing, and he gave you new ideas and new challenges. So it was a, it was a uh, wonderful lab. Irv Copen was there, and every um, he was the other lab mentor, Copen and Axelrod. And on uh, like two days a week, Wednesdays and Fridays, uh, he would have uh, hour sessions with you where he'd uh, go over what your plans were for the week and what your results were and where you were going with your research. There was also a group of people in the lab. So we probably had uh, over the four or five um, what we called yellow berets there who um, all really intelligent people who we kept in contact with. Justin Ziven was one. He's the guy who brought uh, TPA to stroke from heart attack and mm -hmm. took a lot of uh, grief about that um, because the company didn't want to risk, Roche at that time, didn't want to risk uh, losing their myocardial uh, enterprise and they didn't want people to worry about brain bleeding. But he forced through it and uh, made major discovery. Uh, and so he was one of those, um, but a lot of people in the lab were just, it was just an incredible in both intense and wonderful experience. It was actually, it started during the, uh, my wife was at Hopkins doing a residency then. And uh, so as you remember, in that era, the uh, gas crisis occurred. Um, so we started, it turned out two weeks before uh, the gas crisis, a bus service. Um, I organized a bus service from Columbia, Maryland down to uh, NIH. So I set the time. So I said at six, we left at 6.15 in the morning and left NIH at 5.45 in the evening. So I got to do a lot of reading on the bus um, while commuting as well as organizing it. And so uh, it, was, it, was a, it was a wonderfully both intense and uh, fun time. You know, you mentioned NIH and let me just say you know, the audience here, Dr. Roizen is, uh, uh, varies from physicians and nurses and those in healthcare to many in our area, in fact, uh, all of New England that um, aren't in healthcare themselves, they're interested in healthcare topics. And since the pandemic uh, began uh, in 2020, the, the public has really learned a lot of acronyms, CDC, FDA, which they already sort of knew, uh, ACIP, and, and, and now when we talk about the NIH, so they're, they're not as familiar with that that term. Physicians are, of course, because we understand the research behind that. But can you just explain what the National Institutes of Health is? So that yeah, so the NIH has a, an idea. That's exactly right. NIH is the National Institutes of Health, and it was the major driver, and still is, of health research, of medical research. It was the major driver of basic research um, in uh, starting in, I think it was around 1954 or so, or whenever it, it began, I think it was around there, and uh, still is the major driver of um, what we would call basic research, the mechanisms of disease, the mechanisms of treatment. Um, the, uh, the Cancer Institute was one that developed new therapies. Vince DeVita was um, one of the young stars there who still is practicing as chair of, I think, uh, um, oncology at Yale. Um, but he was there for about uh, 30 years. And uh, as I said, uh, um, HIV and uh, a lot of viral diseases were uncovered in their mechanism of treatment. Um, and a lot of the, the basic science that went, that goes into helping us advance cures and helping us advance treatments were developed there. And that's great. And, you know, for the, for the audience, so, and in other words, a lot of the protocols and practices that uh, we've been following over the last couple of years 
in trying to tackle this, um, you know, this new disease with COVID actually come from uh, NIH reviewed and developed uh, me methods of treating and, you know, preventing disease. So we, we listen to the NIH quite a bit, quite a bit. You know, you've had a lot of success uh, and have this messaging about everyday health choices that affect uh, longevity. Can you go into that a little bit? Um, sure, and uh, I, I, I should put a disclaimer on uh, next book is called The Great Age Reboot um, because we're going okay. to get a major change. So when um, when I was, I, I did, I wanted to run an ICU um, as that's where I thought, you know, like that pediatrician, you would get immediate results. Um, so I, in the era I trained in, there weren't ICU training programs. So I did both internal medicine and anesthesia in addition to my research career. And uh, a year out of fellowship, I was actually running in 1978 um, an ICU at University of California, San Francisco, having a ball. And they asked me to, to co-chair cardiovascular anesthesia. And it wasn't because I was so great. It was because the surgeons were relatively difficult to work with. And so um, I uh, found out what they really cared about was how fast their patients returned to function. And California had kept a database since the night, since I think it was 1967, about 12 years at that time, 11 years, on what mattered to outcome. And when I looked at the database carefully and when we analyzed it, um, it was physiologic age. That is not how old your calendar said you were or your brain or your kidney or your liver or even your heart or lung function. It was actually um, how old your body was physiologically. So I said to say, how do we make people 10 to 20 years younger in the two weeks surrounding their operation. And in learning how to do that, which we learned how to do, we then had to say, how do we motivate people to do that? And so that's when the concept of real age started. Real age is the actual age of your body as opposed to your calendar age. And it includes all those things in disability as well as risk of dying. And so we developed the algorithm. It's now on... Uh, 45 million phones in the U.S. and 27 million more worldwide. And uh, that was our way of trying to motivate people. And when we started doing it, the, the web, that was in, when we started planning this, to, uh, the web was very new. And so most people weren't using the web at that time. And so I insisted on keeping the academic rights to the, the real age concept. And um, in doing that, I wrote a book and um, on, on that, Real Age, Are You As Young As You Can Be? It turned out that uh, Oprah wanted to do something on aging in 1999. And so the producer called me and said, will you do something on aging? And I was told by the publisher, you can't do it till at the earliest a week before the book is out because no one will remember it more than a week. So I said no. And at that time, Oprah was in her uh, highlights um, and uh, the producer came and visited my office. I was at the University of Chicago as chair of the department at that time and said, no one's ever said no to Oprah. You sure you, you know, this is, you may never get another chance. And uh, so I said no again. And then when February 23rd came, um, you look. You can look this up. February twenty third, nineteen ninety nine. We were on the show. We had the whole show, but there was a huge snowstorm in the east, oh. and everyone had to stay home. And Oprah was the big thing to watch it uh, from one to four p.m. in the east. It turned out um, that you know, in the first, I was a deer in headlights, right? Because it was my first time. And the producer came over, and in the interim. Uh, between the first and second segments. It was a sweeps week. So she had seven, uh, if you will, land-based cameras, but she also had 17, uh, and she and Jerry Springer were neck to neck, 12.4 and 12.5 million uh, viewers uh, in their shows. And it meant a lot in ad costs. So it turned out when the 
producer came over and said, you got to be more animated. I said, isn't she? And they said, no, you got to be. So I, um, so Oprah comes back and said, what can I do to make my real age younger? And I said, uh, um, floss your teeth, more red wine and uh, more sex. And uh, which were three of the things that, uh, um, and so she went crazy with that. At the next break when we came back um there was there were 300 women in the audience four guys so she goes to one of the guys and she said and he's got a handheld on him right so he's front and center just like we are now and she said uh uh to him does sex make your real age younger and he said oprah i haven't had it in so long i wouldn't know that wasn't the key. Oh, His wife was next to him and she gave him a look oh, and you're not going to for the next 20 years. And uh, she went with that as the as the promo for her show. That was at 9 a.m. in Chicago. She went with that as the promo for the show. By the end of the show, I think we were at 22.4 and, and Springer was at 2.5. Um, so uh, that... that uh, um, obviously changed the way um, Real Age got promoted since uh, a huge number of shows got it. Um, and so- uh, You got involved with the daytime TV wars there. Right, and so it was it was beautiful. We knocked out, I mean, this is crazy, right? We had more attempted hits on our website that day than did AOL, which was the, if you will, got mail site. And uh, not only that, right, we knocked right. out our, our our servers were in San Diego where the tech guys were located and we knocked out uh, the internet from uh, Seattle to uh, San Diego for eight hours that day. It was like a denial wow. of service before there was no, there was such a thing. Anyway, so that was, right. a, that's how we got to motivate people um, to get younger. So what are your best tips then for stress management and, and adequate sleep? What are you telling folks these days? Um, well, as, as I, the, the interesting thing is, so we at that time said 60 could be the new 40, and it has shown up to be because, if you will, if you do, and there are 151 choices you can make to um, help you make your real age younger. But... It now, the research in aging mechanisms is such, and that's why we wrote the Great Age Reboot book, um, that uh, and it's not available yet, so I can show it without any uh, fear, if you will, but it, you can pre-order it on Amazon, etc. But in any yeah. case, um, the point is 90 will be the new 40. We're going to likely get a 30-year jump in our rate of aging because of the science sponsored initially by NIH, but now um, throughout the, the world on aging mechanisms. The best tips have come, believe it or not, were already established on stress in the 1960s from the Alameda County studies and the Woodhall studies in Great Britain, which are the best things are people, your posse and your passion. So having a posse that you can, uh, that is friends, that you can be vulnerable to is the best thing you can do for stress as well as having a passion. Why do you get up in the morning? What is it that drives you? Obviously, you can tell from my crazy um, enthusiasm that this drives me, the ability to get to explain to people they have the choice. Now, meditation helps and guided imagery and there, there are 12 different other techniques, but the strongest ones are posse and passion. As far as sleep, um, that's also the same things. That is, you you want to do a bunch of things that ensure um, that you're not stressed because stress is the reason people often get up at night. The second reason is you want to make sure, and, and there's, there's some a whole bunch of, of what you would call mechanical things. You want to plan for sleep. You want to do it at the same time every day. Um, so, if you will, a bunch of medical things. You want to um, do the sleep hygiene, you know, brush your teeth and, and those things and plan for it those times so you don't feel rushed at the end. You want to 
um, take 10 minutes to do the things you're going to need to do the next morning, like pack food for kids. You want to have that all planned so you can go to bed in a relaxed fashion at the right time. Um, and then you don't want to have a lot of water in the two hours before you go to bed. Yes, you want to hydrate during the day. But in the two hours beforehand, you don't want it because you don't want to get up to urinate and not fall back to sleep. Mm -hmm. And the second reason is your brain gets rid of its poop. Your brain cells waste when your mm -hmm. brain shrinks a little during the night with dehydration. And when it shrinks with dehydration, it opens up channels between the glia cells, like lymphatics and the rest of your body, that get rid of waste. So you get rid of brain poop at night, and that's why you don't want to drink a lot. And so there, there are a whole bunch of little mechanical things that we've gone over. Changing the lights in your bathroom and bedroom so they're only red wavelength lights, um, no blue wavelength after within two hours of going to bed. Changing your cell phone, and there's an on, on the iPhones and on Android phones, there's an automatic red light shift. So you don't see blue lights for two hours before you get go to bed. Um, and you can do those things on your TV as well if you want to do that. But the point is that there are a whole bunch of small mechanical things that make sleep better. But the key for sleep is actually um, not having stress. And the key for that is uh, a passion for what you're doing and a uh, group of posse, a posse or a group of friends. I love it. I love it. The stress part in particular, because when I see people that are stressed, patients mostly, but also uh, medical staff, nursing staff, other people that I work with, the stress has really just morphed into uh, straight on anxiety and, and they're paralyzed. They can't move. And in fact, a lot of us, uh, almost everyone at some point during uh, the past two years, particularly in the beginning of 2020, felt that anxiety that was just paralyzing. And one major way to get out of it, besides the posse, of course, of, of friends to talk about, is really having that passion, developing that. And I think a lot of people have written about it and shown it to be true, um, you know, before the pandemic, of course, but uh, the pandemic has really, has really, you know, highlighted that. <clears throat> I've seen that among patients and, and staff. So you've done quite a bit. And as we just finish up here, and again, we appreciate your time. Tell us, what are you most proud of, uh, either professionally or personally, since you've uh, been working? Well, I suppose uh, personally, I'm most proud of, uh, I've, been, I've been lucky enough to be married to my wife for 49 years. So I guess that's one of the two things. And professionally, it's that uh, when people have analyzed our real age program, um, it, is, it has the best, what we call receiver operant curves. It has the best statistical prediction of how long and well you will live. And um, so it, it, it is, I'm proud that we did the science right on that. And, and that's true for the Great Age Reboot. I'm proud that, that we're, we've, we kept a academic bent and a scientific advisory board that wasn't there just to, to bless things, but was there to analyze and criticize uh, much like a National Institute of Health study section would do each of the data points we used and how we did it. Um, I, I should tell you that, that the, the uh, net, what real age is the net present value of your health choices, the same way you get net present value of investments for investment advisors. Um, it was done by, uh, it was help, the person who helped me design it was a guy named Gary Becker, who I got to uh, care for, he has said that publicly. So I got to care for him. He won the Nobel Prize in economics for the net present value of investments. And so he helped me. Uh, I, I got to care for him and he helped me uh, do the analysis of covariance and then the net present value. And, and I'm, I'm proudest of that we kept a real scientific message in that although it was obviously tailored to humans. I mean, you know, we say go nuts and go fish and a lot of fun things. I mean, that's why the books have sold so well and why, you know, four became number one New York Times bestsellers, not only in the U.S., but in five other countries, including Canada. Um, so the point is I'm, I'm proudest that I've uh, been able to help motivate people with a solid scientific bent so that no one's criticized, that no one's been able to um, uh, if you will, criticize the science for not being accurate.
Thank you so much for sharing your time, Dr. Roizen of the Cleveland Clinic. We really appreciate it. You know, maybe uh, after this book comes out, we can have you on the show again next year and we can uh, answer some questions. I know one of the major things people are going to want to know is, am I starting too late? And I think your message is no, you can start. Uh, I'm going to say that. So I was lucky enough to be on 2020. Barbara Walters asked me that same question. Oh. She said, um, when is it too late? And so I said, when you're six feet under. Until then, <laughs> you get to change what your genes do. And so the basic thing we've learned since 2002, really, since the Human Genome Project came out and the ENCODE Project, which showed what the rest of the DNA was, is you change the way your genes function. And let me just go in one more minute on that is, so when you exercise sure, hard, you turn on a gene in your muscle that produces a small protein, arisen. Arisen goes to the brain and releases or produces brain-derived neurotrophic growth factor, which is like miracle growth for the brain. So why is it that physical activity is one of the best things you can do for your memory and for preventing cognitive dysfunction? It's because you're a genetic engineer and when you do exercise at an intensity, whether it's weightlifting or walking, whatever you do that stresses your muscles, you turn on a gene. We know that, by the way, with Arisen, because I think Mass General and uh, UC San Francisco have tried to patent it the same day, uh, a couple of uh, months, a couple of months or so ago. So we know that that protein may end up being able to be uh, bottled someday. But for now, you're the genetic engineer that turns it on, and so that's the uh, thing you can change your attitude because you get to change which of your genes are on or off. Well, that's an excellent and comforting message. And we look forward to, to reading your newest book that is coming out soon. When do you expect it out, actually? Uh, so the Great Age Reboot comes out, so I'll, I'll show it again shamelessly. It comes out uh, September 13th. Oh, great, soon. That's great. Yeah, this is, this is just an advanced reader copy. So uh, this isn't the real book yet, but <laughs> September 13th. September 13th. Great. I'll also thank Mike Cutler from CAT TV, Ray Smith from Southwestern Vermont Healthcare, Ashley Jowett from Southwestern Vermont Healthcare. I'm Trey Dobson. Go out and find joy in everything you do, even in the face of adversity, and we will see you again next week. <laughs>